Hi, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming to my talk. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, I'm going to, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about my group before I, I just embark on, on my talk. So I have a great group of, of students and postdocs. Some of these are some of my past and present members and, and a lot of, uh, of the work that I do is, is of course with them and what I'm going to be talking about today is indeed the work of, of my students and colleagues. So a little bit about our group, just very quickly, we do a lot of different work. We do work in sequential decision making, personalization and preferences, automated planning, more recently reinforcement learning, search, knowledge and knowledge representation and reasoning, which is where we've historically done a lot of work. Some of the applications that, that, that we've been involved in over the years have been personalization of robot or device plan or program synthesis, plan recognition, cognitive robotics, socially assistive robotics, only, only the software side, um, automated diagnosis, which is something that I, that I did for a very long time, and also web service composition. And, and um, I've worked at various places. I was at Stanford and at Xerox Park, so I did work with NASA and various other um, companies uh, associated with that work. So I just wanted, to, uh, a lot of the work that we've historically done in sequential decision making has been with res using models using uh, transition systems that were either deterministic, non-deterministic, stochastic, that had uh, discrete or continuous behavior, or often hybrid behavior, uh, combinations of discrete and continuous behavior. We've done work on two-player game models where, um, for program synthesis. And we've also done a lot of really interesting work on, on epistemic and multi-agent epistemic planning. So, so sort of almost like theory of mind planning. So you can imagine in a conversational agent or um, even in a, in a, in a deceptive uh, capacity where I know that you know that, that, uh, um, that there are cookies in the, the, the cupboard, but I want to eat the cookies, so I want to perform actions to make you believe that there are no cookies left or that there, there, so that I can eat all the cookies. And I want you, you to tell your friends so that I know that you know that they know that there are no cookies and, and so on, or belief that there are no cookies in the, the, the cupboard. Obviously, they're in, in the context of, of, I think, communication or in, in robots or robots and people seamlessly working together, the ability to be able to understand epistemics and understand the beliefs of other agents is, is really a, a critical um, aspect of, of, of planning. We've also looked a lot at temporally extended goals, temporally extended preferences, and also epistemic and doxastic goals and preferences. So preference, uh, goals about knowledge and goals about belief, about what you know versus what the state of the world is. And, and you'll see that influence in what I'm going to talk about today. Wait, yeah. What's doxastic? Doxastic is belief rather than, than knowledge, yeah. Okay. yeah. So just to sort of ground it a little bit, imagine when I, when I, when I sort of dream at night about what, how AI could help me, um, I think about having a, a robot in my home and think about the types of things that I might like to be able to, to, to say to my robot. Always run the dishwasher after 7 p.m., keep the house temperature below 25 Celsius, run the air conditioner between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., cut the grass after 6 p.m. if there's no rain, uh, when the guests have left, please put all the dishes in the dishwasher and so on. What's interesting about these, these types of goals is that they're not final state goals. They're, they're temporally extended and often they can't all be achieved. And, and, and maybe I convey them using language, but, but, but maybe I want my, my robot to be able to learn some of these things just by watching me. Um, just as, as you would with somebody who you would hire to come into your home, they'll have a certain skill set and certain things that they'll know how to do, but you, you want them to, for, for them to be really a seamless member of your household, you want them to be able to adapt and learn as well as be able to take instructions and, and, and suggestions from you. So models are great. Uh, they predict the outcomes of actions. We can plan to achieve different tasks when we use models. We can generalize, we can compose, we can transfer expertise. And in learning, models really increase sample efficiency. I heard a great talk by, by Chelsea Finn at, at, uh, at, NeurIPS, at a NeurIPS workshop where she was talking about just the impact that, that model-based RL is having on sample efficiency with respect to the work that they're doing. And, and again, what we're going to be talking about today is, is some of that same thematic work, but not with respect to, to models of, of the dynamics of the world necessarily, but with respect to, to our goals and, and the goals and preferences. So where do these models come from? We, we don't always know the models, and when we do write down models, they may not be exact, they may not be reliable. And more importantly, 
um, how do we tell our AI what to do? How does our AI come to be aligned with our values or aligned with the values of the task that it's, it's meant to be performing? How does it learn how to, how to, what, it, what it's meant to be doing? So enter reinforcement learning, of course. That's, and just a sec, my. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, and, and I don't have the audio in, so you don't have the charming, the charming music. But of course, this is, this is DeepMind's um, reinforcement learning system that, that, that amazingly learned this, this incredible ability to be able to, to, uh, to, to um, move through this, this uh, steeplechase, if you will, um, using all sorts of uh, different models of, of, uh, of agent, type of agent. And it's really fascinating on, on a number of different perspectives. Just, it just I think I, I like to show it just because it, it shows the power of, of uh, what reinforcement learning can do with, with, ver with, with very little. So of course, in reinforcement learning, um, there's, a, there's some sort of an agent that, that uh, performs an action in the world, and, and either the environment or some sort of simulated model of the environment um, transitions uh, the, the system, giving outputting a state and some sort of a reward. And, and from that, uh, the agent is, updates its policy and, and over time learns a policy, learns how to act and hopefully learns how to act optimally according to some reward function that exists. And two challenges with uh, reinforcement learning are sample efficiency and reward specification. So sample efficiency, of course, is that RL agents might require billions and billions of interactions in, with the environment to really learn a good policy. And the other challenge is reward specification. It's really hard to define a reward function for a complex task. And, and I think one of the take home messages in, of this, this, this talk is to remember that, that sometimes an RL agent may be operating in the world. And so, so we don't have to model the world. We don't have to model the dynamics of our environment. But it's always the case that somebody, probably one of you, has to program the reward function. Somebody has to write down the reward function to tell the, the reinforcement learning agent what it's going to do. The, you, you can't get around that until we're maybe someday we'll all be wired with sensors and, and, and sweat detectors and all the rest of it and they'll be able to figure out um, what our reward is. But, but for, the, for, for the foreseeable future, somebody has to write that reward. And so what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk is, is work on high level reward function specification and structural decomposition. And this is the work of Rodrigo Toro Ecarta, who is, who is right here. He's a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science. And, and uh, together with Torin Klassen, who's here unrecognizable because he now has a hair, short hair, and, and also Rick Valenzano, who is a postdoc in our group and who's now working at Element AI. Rodrigo had a, an oral presentation at ICML earlier this year and also an oral presentation at AMOS. And we, we did some, some earlier work that, that appeared at Canadian AI um, that, that, that I'm not going to talk about today. But that's actually quite fun, so, so I'd be happy to talk to people about it afterwards. So here's, uh, so I wanted to present the ICML paper to you. And, and it's called Using Reward Machines for High-Level Task Specification, Decomposition, and Reinforcement Learning. And, and this is what Reviewer 3 said, and I think it's a very nice summary, um, uh, his or her summary. To summarize, it's a nice exam, nice simple idea exposing more structure of, the, of uh, an RL problem and the benefits thereof. And that's the punchline of what, what you're going to hear. And there it is again. So we've got this reinforcement learning problem, which, which uh, I introduced to you before and which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And the environment might be the real world, of course, in which case we don't have to model the, the, the transition system or don't have to model um, even what, what, uh, uh, how, it, how it performs. But we always have to program the reward function. So I'm going to um, explain the work in terms of a running example. This is a very simple simulated environment. There's a, a, it's a, a big office space with, with four locations, A, B, C, D. Um, the little snowflakes are, are furniture. There are cough, two coffee machines, and there's an office. And the task that we want to perform is to patrol 
A, B, C, D. We just want somebody to be walking around in perpetuity. At least this is a task that I'd, I'd like to do now. So if you want to build a reinforcement learning agent to do this, you have to write the reward function. And, and someone does. And even if the environment is the real world, you still have to write the reward. Even if your robot is running, well, operating around in here and it's sensing the world, you still have to write the reward function. And so you write that reward function, and this is a reward function that Rodrigo wrote, and it looks like this. But what you do is, is as far as the re reinforcement learning system is concerned, it's a black box. When, you, when the agent performs actions in the world, and you can see this little guy moving, um, it reports its state to the reward function, and the reward function says, nope, zero. And it moves again, tells it where it is, and the reward function says, nope, zero, and so on and so forth. Um, what if we give the agent, so the, the main idea of this, this uh, work is a very simple one, but a very powerful one, I think, which is why don't we take that function and tell the reward, the, the reinforcement learning agent what that reward function is? Why don't we actually re expose that reward function so that it can be, its structure can be used and understood? And that's exactly what we're doing in this work. Is there an advantage of doing this? There actually is because the, the agent can then exploit that structure in order to learn more quickly. And that's what I'm going to show you. And to solve problems that cannot be solved um, now. So in order to do that, we do, we do two things which were the contribution of this paper. We propose a novel language for defining reward functions, a basically a canonical language for describing reward functions called reward machines. And you'll see, see in a minute what it looks like, but it's, it's like a finite state automaton or a mealy machine. And then, together with this, this language, we also provide a reinforcement learning algorithm that exploits that reward machine structure in order to learn uh, more effectively. So here's, here's what a reward machine looks like. So this is the code that Rodrigo wrote, and this is the corresponding reward machine. It's just, it looks a lot like a finite state automaton. And so a reward machine is comprised of a finite set of states, U1, U0, U1, U2, U3, um, and, and uh, I can ex I'll explain these in a bit, but, but again, remember we had that patrol task where we were patrolling from A to B to C to D. Each of these states actually corresponds to first being at A, first, then at B, then at C, then at D, but it can be arbitrarily complex. So a finite set of states, an initial state, U0, uh, again, over that, that vocabulary, and a set of transitions labeled the, the transition you between the states, and those are labeled by a logical condition and a reward, a reward function. And the logical conditions are described over properties of the current state. So in this particular example, the logical conditions that allow us to transition through the reward function uh, are, are whether the agent is at, at A, B, C, or D, whether it's at a piece of furniture, the office, at one of the mail slots, or so on. Um, for, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to uh, just talk about simple reward machines where the reward function is just a constant number, but I wanted to, to again emphasize that this can be an arbitrary function on the label rather than just uh, a constant uh, value. So let's see how, let's see our reward machine in action. What happens? So we start our reward machine, we're starting out at U0. And uh, there's our agent down there, which you, you can watch on the, on the screen. And it, it moves and gives its state. And U0 says, uh, nope, you, uh, you get a reward of 0. And it moves again. And now it's at A. So now it's at A. There's an event detector that detects that it's at A, or, or it's part of the state. And it detects that it's at A. And the state is informed. And the, the reward machine moves to U1. And still, we get no reward. And you can go, and the, the agent could go on and on, um, again, moving. When it gets to B, and it's detected at B, it again, it gives its state, and it transitions to U2. Again, it's in, it stays in that state as it moves along until it finally gets to C, and again, moves to C, gets again a reward of 0, and on and on down until it gets to D informs the system of its state, and it gets a reward of 1. We can define more complicated problems, like a delivery problem, where this is delivering uh, coffee to the office, where you start in a, in a state where you're not at the coffee machine, and, and you stay there until you, get to, until you get coffee. When you get coffee, you move to U1, get a reward of 0. 
um, when you get to, and then when you transition to from getting coffee to uh, um, uh, to to going to the office, which is the O right there, you get a reward of one, and then you just stay in this this accepting condition afterwards. And we can define all sorts of other reward functions: deliver coffee and, and mail the office, which represents you can see there are two paths to achievement: getting the coffee first and then the mail, or getting the mail first and then the coffee. Um, delivering uh, coffee while avoiding the furniture, a safety condition. Um, in this particular example, the reward machine, it's interesting, you can have, see arbitrarily complex logical formulae on the transitions, and it's also the case that you can have a sync state. So once you, if you hit the furniture, then you're done, and you know that, that, that you're no longer going to get reward because you've, you've fallen off the cliff, the proverbial cliff. So how do we actually re exploit that reward machine structure? You've seen how we specify uh, reward functions using, using this automata structure. Now the question is how we actually exploit it. And, and we, had f we explored four different ideas. Three turned out to be baselines that we used. And then the fourth turned out to be our approach, which turned out to be very effective. So I'm going to go through the three baselines and then through our approach and show you some of the experimental results that we received. So reward machines might define non-Markovian reward. A lot of the things, if you go back to the examples that I, I gave you at the beginning about my robot, my dream for my robot um, in my house, or, or when I think about the reward function that I have for my children, which, which you know, for example, involves um, if they're getting ice cream, serving themselves ice cream, I want them to open the fridge, take the ice cream out, serve themselves, which is where they would like to stop. Um, but I'd like them to put the ice cream back in the, in the freezer and close the freezer again. Um, and that's when I will give them some reward. So it's a, it's a long, you know, complicated process that is non-Markovian where you have to remember the history. It's not just dependent upon the state. And in the case of our, of our very simple example here, you can see it. If, if I'm here and I move to D, if I was in U1 and I moved to D, I would get a reward of zero. But if I'd already been through A, B, C, and uh, A, B, and C, and, and was in U3, and I moved to D, same then, same state, but I now receive a reward of one. So the reward actually depends upon the history. And that history, that non-Markovian history, is captured in, in, in the reward machine. So let's say that we just wanted to use an MDP. Now we have a non-Markovian reward. So what, do we, what are we going to do? We're going to take that automata and take the cross product of the automata and actually stick it into the MDP. So the MDP is not going to only transition over the typical tra Markovian transition function that you have, but it's also going to transition simultaneously over the state of this, 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 this um, automata that is going to keep track of the state of the system. But keep tra these transitions are Markovian. And so it's going to keep track using this extra bookkeeping step in order to keep track of this complex function. So that was one of our baselines. And we used a simple Q-learning baseline. We include the reward machine state to the agent's state uh, uh, representation. And then we learned policies using standard Q-learning. That's, that's baseline one. Baseline two is, an, uh, uh, is a hierarchical reinforcement learning baseline. So the idea is that you're going to have a set of options. And you're going to learn a meta controller over those set of options, over those sets of macro actions. And you're going to define one option per proposition in the reward machine. And then you're going to optimize for the policies for each one of those propositions. So for example, in this particular case, we're going to learn options or, or policies for, for A, for B, for C, and for D. And we're going to have a meta controller that's going to choose what we're going to do, much, much like options. The third. Just a question yeah. about these options. Yeah. So uh, each option there to go to one of the states? Yeah, there. that's right. So what's the optimal policy for getting to A? What's the optimal policy for getting to B, for C, and for D? Okay. But they are not like optimized for the whole reward of the task. No. So yeah, and, and you'll see I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a, in a second. So maybe hold that, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer further in a sec. So, so the third thing that we, we wanted to do was to give the, the hierarchical reinforcement learning system a little bit of a boost. And so we wanted to augment it with the reward machine. So, so that the reward machine could actually prune useless options using the current reward machine state. So again, same model as we saw before. But now, if you know you're at u0, then you know the only policy that, that you should be looking at is, is pi of a. And so you can prune these other, these other um, 
uh, uh, policies from your meta controller and, and thereby, and again, remember there are some that are disjunctive. There isn't always only one policy that works, but thereby you can, you can actually um, be more efficient in terms of your learning. So one problem with hierarchical uh, reinforcement learning is that it might converge to the, the, a suboptimal policy. Because it's, it's myopic in terms of what it's doing, it's, it's, it's constructed this option. And we see this in, in, in uh, hierarchical planning as well. Same, same sort of problem exists even, even in, in non-learning settings where something will, will actually often go to the, the uh, a suboptimal policy. And, and you can see it demonstrated here. So if we've got this simple, um, the simple uh, uh, go get coffee and then go to the office reward machine. The, the optimal thing to do in terms of, of steps is to get the coffee for, and you start at A, it, to get the, the coffee and then here and then go to the, uh, to the office here. But what an HRL, a hierarchical reinforcement learning system will do instead is it will myopically go to the best coffee location because this coffee is closer than that, that coffee machine. But in, in committing to go here, then it has a very long path to go to the office afterwards. And so it, it, uh, HRL often prunes the optimal um, policy. So the fourth approach, which is our approach, which you're going to see in the experimental results in a minute, is, is to do Q learning for reward machines, QRM. And, and here's how the approach works. We learn one policy, so one Q function, per state in the reward machine. So there's going to be a Q0, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we're going to, and, and we're going to learn them all simultaneously and using off-policy learning. We're going to select an action using the policy of the current reward machine state, and then, for example, Q0, and then we'll go to A0, and so on, Q1, and then, go to, and then we'll reuse the experience to update all the Q values. So we, we're using off-policy learning and, and uh, experience replay techniques in order to, to do some of this. So again, the idea is that we're going to learn all of these policies simultaneously, um, and then we're going to transition through them. So here's the QRM learning step. We're at U0. We could do a state. We get it 0, and we update Q0 and we, we take the max at Q0. When we're at Q1, we update Q1. Whoops, sorry. We update Q1. When we're, we're at Q, we update Q2. And the reason that this is here is because what happens here is more interesting. When we get to Q3, we actually uh, get a reward of 1. But the Q3 update is updated with respect to Q0 because that's where our future lies. So QRM is, is, uh, uh, converges to the optimal policy in the limit. That's provable, just like, just like um, tabular uh, Q learning does. And let's just look at our results. So we, did, we, we studied two discrete domains, the office domain, which you saw, which had four tasks, and also the, the sort of Minecraft domain, which Jacob Andreas developed, which had 10 tasks. And uh, we also did a continuous state domain um, with, with uh, deep RL, and it was the water domain. And we did 10 tasks over that domain. So uh, in the discrete domain, uh, we tested these four algorithms that I, that I mentioned to you, the three baselines and then QRM. And uh, just as a, a recap, um, both Q learning and QRM are provably optimal. The others aren't. And, and these are both hierarchical reinforcement learning techniques. These three techniques use some form of decomposition. But, but of course, Q learning doesn't. And so um, here's the office domain. Again, on the, on the uh, y axis is the normalized discounted rewards. So we have a one at the top here. And we have the num of her training steps along here. This is 50,000. I think everybody can, can read that at the top. And we did four, four tasks of 30 independent trials. And QRM is the red. You can see that QRM um, uh, uh, converges to the optimal solution. Whereas the hierarchical reinforcement learning with the reward machine um, is the second best, but did much poorer hierarchical reinforcement learning was here. And then just simple Q learning did, did much more, more poorly. In the Minecraft domain, we took 10 tasks defined by, by Jacob Andreas over 10 random maps, three different trials. 
and uh, yeah, Minecraft or craft domain. So again, we are the red and we converge to the optimal. Um, hierarchical reinforcement learning with the um, reward machines converges much more quickly, but, but it is eventually the HRL does a little bit better. And uh, those are our discrete results. In the continuous domains, do you have a sense, I mean, Q-learning will, in the limit, perform well? Can you see it? Yeah, so I'm just wondering if you have a sense of how to extrapolate from that. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know whether Rodrigo does. Uh, I ran for a long time, I'm considering everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it will converge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, by, by, by definition, it will converge. Yeah, it's just, and I, I guess that's back to the point of sample efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yes, for those who did not notice it, this is Q learning right here. It's at the bottom. More interesting, perhaps, is, is, is the work on, on, on uh, continuous domain. So we, um, we went from a tabular QRM to a deep version of QRM. We replaced the Q learning with, by double DQN uh, with prioritized experience replay in our four uh, approaches. And again, uh, we lose optimality, of course, but, but we still have the decomposition. And this is, I don't know how many people know this water world domain, but these are balls that are, that are floating around and bouncing off of the walls in the, in the end. We're controlling this little white ball, looks a little bit like billiards. And the types of, of goals that we used were, you know, hit, hit a red ball, then a green ball, then a blue ball, or hit a, and, and of course don't, implicitly don't hit anything else uh, in between. And so uh, 10 tasks over 10 random maps, three trials per map. And, and we, DQ, DQRM, which is our deep QRM, uh, is in the red. And you can see that it, it, it outperforms everybody else. A deep hierarchical re reinforcement learning, deep hierarchical re reinforcement learning with reward machines, and double DQN, which is the blue, which again is really not performing very well. So just to recap, what are you meant to take away from here? We propose to show the reward functions code to the agent. That's, that's the main, simple, nice, elegant idea. We provided a canonical language, a representation for doing that in the form of something we refer to as a reward machine, which is quite expressive and allows not only for scalar numbers here, but, but for complex reward functions, even at the, at the label states. And we showed how to decompose the problem using an associated algorithm so that we could learn much more quickly and solve problems that couldn't be solved. QRM outperformed plain RL and HRL in two discrete domains, and it was also effective when combined with deep learning compared to, to really powerful techniques. Yeah. So one question. So one thing I didn't completely get. So if you're going to this talk about uh, policy to get to each of the states in the reward machine, some of those states require that you've already visited the other states. So are you, in, in some sense, so... so when you, does your policy take into account the fact that like, before you visit B, you have to visit A? So, so, the, the, yeah, so the poli the, each policy learns what to do optimally um, to, to, uh, to, to, to do the reward machine, and it learns it over time, yeah. So it takes into account, it knows the whole structure of each, each, each of the, like getting to B, it knows that it has to go to A first when you construct some policy for that. Uh, it, it learns that. It learns so where, where do the reward machines come from? That's a great question, right? You see these reward machines, you think, gee, can I write a function that looks like that's finite state automata? I'm not sure whether I can or not. Um, and so, so two obvious answers are that we want to create the reward machines either by writing finite state automata or we want to learn them. And uh, oops, um, Rodrigo is working on learning reward machines He's in, uh, right now, and hopefully there will be a publication on that soon. Um, and it's a very interesting problem with all sorts of, of implications, and I, I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit more was, was how we create reward machines. And for those of you who have undergraduate degrees in computer science, you will all remember that finite state automata, hopefully you'll remember your formal languages course in finite state automata, and that finite state automata can express regular expressions and, and a variety of, of different formal languages. They're, they are quite expressive. Remember the Chomsky hierarchy, context-free language, Languages, context sensitive languages. Find, you know, these are, are quite expressive. We, we haven't characterized the expressive power of them, but, but many, many different languages, including natural languages or controlled natural languages, can be, can be mapped into these automata. And these automata can work both as generators 
and as as uh, as recognizers. They just rec they generate and recognize strings that capture the function that's being represented in this in this canonical form. But one of the things that we did, um, uh, and, and it was inspired by some of the work that we've previously done in our lab, one of the things that we did before we did this reward machine work was that we looked at a, particular, a particularly compelling language that's compelling from a human form. And just to, I'm, I want to motivate it with a, um, a slide that I got from Percy Liang. I don't know whether anybody else saw Percy Liang give a talk. And if you did, you know the answer to this question. But for those of you, who, so if you were not here at Percy Liang's talk, the question is, look at this pattern and, and try to tell me what the pattern is. You, can, you see the different patterns are labeled with ones or zeros. So what, what is the, the zeros are the negative examples and the ones are the positive examples. What is it that you, uh, um, what's the pattern? Anybody want to? Yeah? At least two red? Excellent. At least two red blocks. Sorry, I have no prize. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So, so I think the, what's, what's interesting, and I hope what, 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 what I found evocative in this example, and the reason why I wanted to share it with you, is, is that, that language is a very powerful tool for capturing complex patterns. You know, we, we as human beings have developed language over, language has evolved over thousands of, hundreds of thousands of years as an effective way for us to, to communicate abstractions about the world. That we, we, and, and we've evolved it in order to communicate those abstractions. And, and different, you know, that when, if, you, if you read much uh, about anthropologists, anthropologists often talk about different, different cultures and different peoples who have different vocabularies and words for things that they need to discriminate. So it's, it's very functional and purposeful in, in the way that it's evolved. And so, so using language, I think, to natural language or, or controlled natural language to, to construct reward machines or to convey reward is, is very compelling. And again, I go back to this example of the robot and think about some of the types of human input that we might like to, to provide to uh, um, a reinforcement learning agent and how we might be able to do that. Again, you don't, it doesn't have to be conveyed using language. It doesn't have to be necessarily written down. We can learn these things just as we learn language. But, but, but this is something I think that's evocative for, for us in the room as, as, as humans. So the second, th uh, in the spirit of that, the second thing I'm going to talk about is, is earlier work that we did before we did the reward machine work on teaching multiple agents, uh, multiple tasks to a reinforcement agent using LTL and where LTL stands for linear temporal logic. And I will return to LTL in a minute. So the, the, what we were looking at in this, this talk was, or this work was how, how can we instruct RL agents? How can I tell that robot in my home that I, I want them to turn on the dishwasher um, only after 6 o'clock, but only if, it's, you know, if, if I don't need dishes um, for dinner and, and so on and so forth, these complex non-Markovian rewards. And I'm going to illustrate this in the context of, of this Minecraft example. Again, this is a, an example that Jacob Andrea used um, in his sketches work. And some of you may have seen it in that context if you, if you read the RL literature. So this is sort of like Minecraft. It's a simplified version of Minecraft. We have a little guy named Luigi who's right here. And Luigi, Luigi can do a bunch of different things. He can collect raw materials. So he can collect wood, grass, iron, gold, and gems. And he can make objects. He can make uh, and, and make new objects. A factory, a tool. There, oh, sorry. There's a, a factory. Uh, he can make new objects. There's also in the in the um, in his world a factory, a tool shed, and a workbench. So to make a bridge, for example, and this was Jacob's example, you get wood, iron, and then you use the factory. So here's some simple goals that we might have. Here's some things that we might want Luigi to do. We might a single goal: get wood. We might have a sequence of goals, get wood and then use the factory, disjunctive goals, get wood or iron, conjunctive goals, get grass and iron, or even safety constraints. Do not leave the shelter at night. This is a very simple example, but I hope that, that it's evocative of the types of things you can imagine in a complex world, the types of things, the types of, of rewards that you might like, th tasks that you might like to, to give to, your, to an agent in, in your world. So the question is, how can we instruct a reinforcement learning agent to do this? How can, and, and let's use a language to do that. So the, what we were looking for was a language that was expressive, that the RL agent could understand, and so that we could describe our tasks in terms of a reward function 
and uh, that, that we would be able to learn fast. So some of the same objectives that you saw last time when, when um, we were doing it. And we also want it to be understandable to a human. So two pieces of, of previous work that are related that some people may know about are hindsight experience replay, um, which was done by Peter Abiel's group. Um, and, and in that work, uh, they only had a single condition. So I, I'm going to abbreviate this as HER. So they were able to describe things like get wood or you know, shoot the puck in the goal, um, for example, but, but not some of these other uh, types of techniques. And they, they, like us, used off policy learning to do it. The other thing that we're going to compare with is, is policy sketches, which was developed by Jacob Andreas and, and appeared at ICML um, 17. Uh, that work only allows you to describe sequences of sub-goals, so only sequences, and it deco decomposes the problem using, using what, what he referred to as a sketch. So do this, then do this, then do this, do this, but always sequences. So he was able to, to capture these two tasks but, and, uh, and use task decomposition to do it, but he was not able to express these other tasks. Whereas we um, can express all of these tasks we use off-policy learning, and we also use task decomposition. And the technique that I'm going to tell you is, is very reminiscent of, of, of what I told you about the reward machines, because we did this work first, and that's what inspired us to do our more general reward machines. So first, how do we specify tasks in LTL? So let's give the reinforcement learning agent a set of high-level action detectors. And this is sort of the key to, to, to um, at least some of what we've done. So, so in this particular uh, scenario, the state is complex and, and the actions that are in the state are move, 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 move. But we want to be able to describe instructions in a, in a way that a human understands. So we assume that we have a set of event detectors, a set of objects that we recognize in the world or properties that we can recognize in the world, something like a relational representation of the world. And we have associated with those a set of event detectors that we can, so we can assess the truth or falsity of those properties within the world. And those, those uh, event detectors become the vocabulary for what we're going to allow the human to use to describe our reward function. So got wood, got iron, got grass, used workbench, used factory, is night at shelter, and so on. And we're going to use LTL to describe those things. So linear temporal logic, LTL, very quickly, is, um, is a propositional modal temporal logic. It's been used for years and years. How many people have heard of LTL before? Yeah, a few people. Okay, so, so um, uh, it's been used for years for, for verification. This is the what, LTL or CTL is typically used for verifying uh, safety critical systems. It's used as a specification language for program synthesis or for controller synthesis. And it's a very powerful language. It allows you to effectively put constraints on the evolution of a trajectory. So, so you define an LTL formula. It's interpreted over either finite or infinite traces. And the, the formula is satisfied if the trace satisfies the, the LTL formula. And again, L, it's propositional logic that's, that's augmented with these temporal modalities that say next, eventually, until, uh, always, and, and so on. So in the case of our, our, our example here, we can say, triangle wood, which is eventually got wood, eventually got wood, and eventually used factory, and, and so on. And, and just to make it easier for everybody to read so they don't have to remember which is the triangle and which is the box, um, uh, uh, we, we use English here. But, but, but for example, the box, which is, you don't see here, which is always, is, is very powerful for safety constraints. And, and you can nest all these temporal operators so you can say eventually always be at home or, or various other complex conditions. So again, now back to this example. Um, we have a very simple for, uh, formula that we want to be able to satisfy. Eventually got wood and eventually used factory and eventually got gold. And we're currently, uh, our event detector tells us that we're at the shelter. So there's Luigi, he's at the shelter. And what we want to do is Luigi's starting to move in the world. And he's walking around, see no, no event is being detected. Oh, he detected got wood, but that has nothing to do with our formula, so nothing happens. And we move along, got iron. So now we've got iron, and we see that that's satisfied. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the formula to only remember now what's left to do. So now we only have to satisfy eventually use, 
used factory and eventually got gold. So Luigi keeps on moving and, and eventually satisfies all these things. One of the keys to our, our, the algorithm that we've developed, which is LPOPL, uh, um, Linear Temporal Logic Progression, or LTL Progression with Off-Policy Learning, LPOPL, um, is that we, we actually use this mathematical technique called progression to break apart the linear temporal logic formula into its subfragments, into what needs to be satisfied now or consumed now, and then what remains to be consumed. So if I say eventually P, either P is true now and, and, and I've satisfied the formula, or P is not true now and in the next state, my goal is eventually P. If it's, if it's P, if it's P and, or if it's always Q, then Q has to be true now and in the next state, uh, always Q still has to be true because always Q always has to be true. So progression is a, a correct and well-defined procedure that allows us to basically consume or eat through these lim linear temporal logic formulae. But it also allows us to break it apart into its pieces. We can walk through the formula, progress the formula, and break apart the, the, the various components of it. And again, the examples that I showed you were very, very simple. Um, but you can imagine arbitrarily nested complex formulae that, that, that would have to be processed. So here's, again, our example. Uh, Luigi's moving along, and he, he's got the gold, so he's got gold. And uh, once that's true, then a eventually used factory needs to be true. Nothing is detected. He's moving along in the world, used factory. That gets eaten or consumed, and then the formula is true, and we have a reward of one. So associated with each LTL formula is, is a reward of one if it's satisfied and zero if it's not satisfied. But you can imagine um, weighting these or combining them together in various ways with an objective function to do some sort of other learning. That was not what we were doing here. We were giving instructions um, that we wanted definitely solved. So the LTL formulae are a way of conveying a reward function and we're giving zero or one rewards. But that can be, and it can be learned using standard RL. But we can do better. So what I'm going to show you is this algorithm, LPOPL, which we, we developed. So suppose Louise has to learn two tasks. Um, the first task, that get, get wood and use the factory and then eventually get the gold or eventually got grass or wood and eventually use the factory. What we're going to do again is learn these, these policies simultaneously. And, and Luigi is going to start by trying to solve uh, phi 1, which is the first formula here. So Luigi is at the shelter. He's got these two, these two formulae, but he's, he's actually trying to do this one right here, or learn this one right here. So none, 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 he's walking along, and he got some wood. Um, so got wood is not really relevant here, but it actually turns out that it's relevant here in the second formula. So LPLPL learns all the tasks in parallel. It takes all these tasks, it separates them, and it allows you to learn the policies for each of those pieces simultaneously. So in step one of our algorithm, we decompose our tasks into subtasks using LTL progression. So, so these two formulae get broken down into all of their, their um, fragments. And then we learn all of those fragments and progress through those fragments simultaneously. I'm going to use, go back to the triangle notation just to, to uh, or the diamond notation, excuse me, just to make it a little bit simpler. In step, step two, we learn one policy per subtask using off-policy learning. And so, for example, if we're, we're doing uh, uh, var phi four, um, used factory and got gold, and we've got, and you can see where Luigi is here, nothing happens. Um, and we're doing Q updates on all these different Q functions, one Q function for each of these simultaneously. We're at Q4, we, we got the gold, so now we've satisfied that aspect of the formula. So now what's left, according to progression, is that we have to, to go to uh, uh, 5. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to 5, we're going to update 4 with the discounted uh, arg max of Q5, and we're going to go to Q5 because that's our future for Q4. Q4 knows that it, it, it satisfied the first part, but now it has to satisfy Q5. So Q5 is, is the update rule here. And now it goes to Q5. And uh, once it satisfies, uh, oh, and sorry, and Q6 got the value of 1 because it, it satisfied got gold. 
And so we can see how these are all fed together. We, we're satisfying the components, but we're also learning these more complicated policies sort of related to, I think, Rich's question previously about, about the reward machines. And, and all of these things can be updated. Again, this is, this is interesting because Q4 is updated by Q5 because it's, it's conjunctive. And the, you can define all the rules accord, uh, respectful of, these progression, of the progression and, and decomposition of these, these formulae. Just a question. When you get to P6, that gets the reward of P5. It's, so do you kind of propagate all the rewards back and update, or it would be? Yeah, they're all the doing off. They're all be so all the rewards are being done. They're all computed. Sorry, using these formulae exactly. So this, these, all of these updates are being done simultaneously. And and we can prove again that that uh, we converge to an optimal policy. So again, uh, I'm going to. I think I'm getting low on time, probably. So I'll try to speed up a bit. Um, we studied the LPL, uh, LTL progression uh, with off-policy learning and DQN. We compared with standard RL, and we compared with some alternative decomposition methods, some hierarchical decomposition methods. We had three baselines: a DQNL, um, which was which was based on this Nature 15 paper, and two hierarchical learning techniques, and um, so this was actually sort of interesting. So we, we, we tested, we took the tasks in the, um, that Jacob Andreas had without unneeded ordering constraints. So remember, Jacob Andreas had, had sketches that, that required you to do one thing and then do another. Everything was sequential. And in a lot of cases, it didn't matter whether you got the wood first or got the, uh, or, or, uh, got, or got the other thing first. So we took away any unnecessary ordering so that, that our system could, could actually use those. And, and uh, we tested on five random maps. And you can see, again, um, LPOPL is the red. It converges to optimal. The hierarchical learning techniques did not, uh, did not um, do as well. And DQNL, uh, again, performed much more poorly. We had a second set of, of, of tests which were adversarial maps. So again, hearkening back to, to the discussion before, some of these hierarchical decomposition techniques actually um, don't, um, can't get the optimal results. So again, if, if in Jacob's case, for example, if he, he did something in a particular order and it was the wrong order, then you would, you would not get the right, um, the right uh, or, or sorry. If, yeah, if you, if you decompose these things hierarchically and you chose the wrong order, then you might get this a suboptimal. You might prune the optimal solution to your, your, your task. And so you can see that in these adversarial cases where, again, we converge to optimal and the others, and the others do not. And that can be shown, again, uh, if you have to get the wood, um, you go to the a hierarchical learning technique would go to the wood first, but then take a long time to get um, to its second objective, whereas with uh, um, our technique, you would, you would do both. So we also, another interesting aspect of this was that, we, again, with LTL, we can have safety constraints. And we had um, uh, a constraint that said that you had to stay in the shelter while it was night. I guess maybe there are, there are wolves or, or scary zombies outside that, that, that again, it must be zombies because it's Minecraft. Um, zombies that would, that would get you. And so again, in this, in this uh, case, we again did far superior in, bo in both the, uh, um, the random maps and also in these adversarial maps. So recap of this work, which was the second work and, and earlier work, we were interested in this work and how we can instruct reinforcement learning agents. Um, the proposal was to define tasks using linear temporal logic, which is a very compelling language. It's human friendly and, and it's used in a lot of safety critical systems for specifications and for, and for liveness constraints. Um, it had the desirable properties that it was expressive, more expressive than languages people are using for, for other types of similar things. The reinforcement learning agent could understand it. We described the tasks in terms of reward functions, and we um, used the task to decomposition to learn faster and, and made it understandable for humans, which speaks, I think, to this notion of, of human interpretability. The other interesting thing, and I think this is a common, common question, when you see linear temporal logic, you, you think, well, why not use 
natural language. And, and yes, that is sort of a long-term goal of ours to go all the way from natural language. But, but there, uh, it, to the extent that people often use controlled natural languages now, there has been work, and this is just one example of, of translating from controlled natural languages into linear temporal logic. So there, I think what I, what I wanted to convey to you, I think, is just the opportunities that present themselves with this type of work. And again, as, uh, and I think I mentioned this, but just to be clear, linear temporal logic is expressible in a finite state automata in the finite case or in a Buchi automata in the infinite case. And so it could be captured by our reward machines. We could translate LTL into reward machines and use the first work that I described, which was later work that we did, as well as, as many, many other interesting languages. So just to recap, thank you for your, your patience. I talked about two different things. I talked about uh, using reward machines for high-level task specifications and then this work on, on linear temporal logic. The takeaway message is twofold. At the beginning, I talked about two challenges of reinforcement learning, um, sample efficiency and also reward function specification. Uh, using what, what you should be taking away is that using a learning algorithm that exploits the structure of the reward function can improve sample efficiency. We saw that both with the reward machine work and we saw it with the linear temporal logic work. The second takeaway message is, is about reward specification. And again, the this challenge was that it's really hard to define reward functions for complex tasks. And, and I hope to a certain extent I've, I've motivated the, the need for, for, for complex tasks, for complex non-Markovian tasks when a reward function really is a, a Markovian thing. You know, it, match, it maps a state or a state in an action to a reward. And, and, and what I hope you take away from this talk is that reward machines provide a rich canonical form for specifying the structure of a reward function and exposing it to the agent. You have to, everybody has to write those reward functions. You may not have to model the world. You may not, you may be able to just explore, but you always have to write a reward function. And reward machines can be written, they can be translated from another language, um, or they can be learned. And, and again, hopefully that's going to be uh, published soon or constructed via translation from formal or, or not so formal languages. If you want to learn more, um, these are the two citations. Again, the authors, this is Rodrigo Toro Icarta's work, uh, together with Torin Klassen, who's also here, uh, Rick Villanzano, who was, was in Toronto, and uh, well, he's still in Toronto, but he's no longer at the university, he's now at Element AI, and also me. Rodrigo has all of his code available, um, and so you can, and, and if you don't, well, I guess this is being recorded, so you can find out where the code is. And uh, questions, or let's eat lunch. <laughs>